If you have your Bibles, join me in turning to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Or actually, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the third book in the New Testament. And this morning we want to talk about Christmas journeys. Christmas is a season filled with times of travel. It is filled with songs about travel. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh, o'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. <laughs> all right. Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horses away to carry the sleigh through the way we drift in snow. But here we come caroling among the leaves so green. Or come on this lovely one, or sleigh ride together with you. <laughs> songs all about travel. Uh, so many songs about travel. Some of you are probably planning on doing some traveling over Christmas break and over the holidays. Uh, some of you will go across town to be at mom's house or grandma's house. Some of you will go across the state. Some people go across the country. So much travel going on. And when we look at the journey of the first Christmas, we see that those journeys were not pleasant and desirable like our travels are at Christmas time. Normally when we think of biblical Christmas journeys, we think of one. We think of Mary and Joseph coming down on the donkey from, uh, from the north, wherever at, all the way down to Bethlehem, so where Jesus is born. But as we're going to see, there are many more travels. We might think of the, the three magi, the three wise men, although we're not even going to consider their travel today. But we're going to look at several other Christmas journeys. Journeys that are not necessarily desirable for and journeys that we're going to learn from their example and the lessons they teach us. Hopefully you have found Luke chapter 1. Going to look in verse 39 to begin with. Here we find the journey of Mary when she first finds out she is pregnant. In verse 26, uh, we read, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Jump down to verse 31. You will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name of Jesus. And then verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at the scriptures, as we think about Christmas journeys, help us to learn from each journey and to be <coughs> encouragement for what we will face in our lives because of what we see in these journeys. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here in this first journey, Mary hurries, gets ready and hurries to a town in the hill country of Judea. We learn from this journey to accept unexpected circumstances. Accepting unexpected circumstances. Being pregnant was definitely the last thing on Mary's mind. She and, and Joseph had not been sexually active. They hadn't been fooling around. They were both keeping themselves pure. In verse 34, we see that Mary's first response when the angel says you're going to have a child is, how will this be? There is no way I'm going to be pregnant. But she did. She did get pregnant, even though it was nowhere on her radar, radar at the time. So Mary faces a test of the faith. This is a test regarding God's choices. It's the same test each one of us faces on a daily basis. Not being pregnant miraculously, I don't believe anybody here is going to face that same test of faith but rather accepting God's will. Especially when it goes against all of our plans. We, we plan our life out. We, we, we think we have everything in line of what, what we want our life to look like. And then God intervenes and throws something right in front of us that we had not planned for. We face a test of faith as to whether or not we will trust God. Because so often we tell God all of our plans, and as it says in Psalm 2, He who sits in the heavens 
laughs. In, in the movie, uh, something to sing about. Uh, they, they, they say, you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Because so often God brings the unexpected into our lives. And when he puts these roadblocks in our pathway, we understand it can either be a stumbling block or a stepping stone. As we face the unexpected, that test of faith can shake us. And we can really stumble spiritually because we can't get over this roadblock. Or God can use that unexpected circumstance to really boost us and to encourage us and to lift our strength and lift our faith. It all depends on whether or not we will accept God's will as best. In response to her unexpected circumstances, Mary takes a trip. A long journey. Mary is a young, single woman. She is up north in the region called Galilee, uh, in Nazareth. And she comes on a ten-day trip down through Samaria. You remember from John 4, the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. Sometimes they even went all the way around the country because they didn't want to even meet the Samaritans. She comes down to the hill country of Judea to see her relative Elizabeth. The wilderness is desolate that she passes through. Uh, the hill country where Elizabeth lived, a very desolate region. The journey itself would have been quite daunting. Most of us, you would think, ah, you know, it's a, you know, 80 miles, that's not bad. I, I can make that in two hours my car. Mary traveled probably either on foot or on donkey. It was a very long, arduous journey. She probably didn't travel alone because of danger. She probably found a caravan that was passing through and joined along with the caravan. But there's no mention of Joseph or any other family members traveling with her. Down in verse 45, we see Mary's faith in responding to God's choices. Uh, back up, looking up at verse 39, it says, At that time Mary got ready, hurried to a town in the whole country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Then you jump down to verse 45, and notice what she says. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Even when it doesn't make sense to her, Mary chooses to believe God. She chooses to trust that God's choices are best. So the first Christmas journey we think about is the lesson of facing unexpected circumstances with faith. For many people, Christmas is a very hard time of year. Uh, they remember the Christmas as a time that a loved one died. They remember Christmas as a time where uh, somebody was diagnosed with a terminal disease. Many people come into Christmas with the news, well, you won't have a job in the new year because we're going to have to lay you off. Many times uh, Christmas is accompanied by the sad news that your son or daughter won't be coming home for the holidays. And what should be a time of celebration is really a time of sadness. But like Mary, we need to take each unexpected circumstance that we face and face them in faith. The Christmas story continues on to mention another unwanted journey. Down verse 56. Mentions it with only four words. It says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Four words, and then returned home. We, we read right over, we, we pass right over those words. Mary gets to spend three months with Elizabeth helping her with her pregnancy, making plans for the future, worshiping and rejoicing together because Elizabeth had been barren and she is miraculously able to conceive a child. Mary comes miraculously pregnant and they are able to rejoice in the Lord together for three months. But then come those four words and then return home. We read right over them, but we fail to think about what they mean. The lesson for us in this journey back home, ten days back up through the wilderness, 
But the greater dangers come when she gets home. This is a lesson about accepting dangerous decisions. The same uh, journey back through the wilderness, back through Samaria, back to Nazareth. When she gets home, Mary knows the law. She knows that she is engaged. But the engagement of Jewish times is very different than our engagement today. Today, people think nothing of being engaged three, four, five, six times. You know, they're engaged for a couple weeks and they break off the engagement. That think nothing of it. <coughs> engagement in Jewish times was very different. Because Mary and Joseph, their engagement was a legal commitment to marriage. They were formally husband and wife, except that they were not allowed to be sexually active until the wedding ceremony. There was a waiting time to make sure that your fiancé had been sexually pure. <coughs> there was no easy five-minute pregnancy test in the first century. So they had a waiting period. But that engagement was a commitment. So Mary comes back to Nazareth. She is now three months pregnant. Joseph is, able to, is going to be able to tell she's put on some weight at Elizabeth's house. Very soon he's going to be able to see the bulge in her tummy. And what will that mean? It might mean Mary's life is forfeit. Because the penalty for adultery was stoning. They took you out to a place with a lot of rocks. They stood you up against the wall. Everybody picked up a big rock and started hitting you with rocks until you were dead. And as Mary comes back, this journey back to Nazareth, this fear would be very prominent in her mind. What will Joseph do? Is he going to pick up the first stone? Is the man I am committed to marry going to believe me, or is he going to kill me? Will they make a public display of shaming Mary? I'm sure there must have been all kinds of fears of, of safety for her own life as she travels ten days back up to Nazareth. The test of faith is one of consistency. Will Mary continue to follow God no matter what the consequences are? She had to face her fears as she returns back up to Nazareth, back up to her home, back up to Joseph. Many of us, if we were married, would have said, you know what, Elizabeth, it's been fun helping you. Why don't I just stay down here with you? You know, I'm out here in Hill Country. I can stay here until I deliver my baby, and then, then I can go back and nobody can point a finger and say, well, she was pregnant. I can just say, well, you know, I, I picked up the baby while I was down visiting Elizabeth. And we come up with all ways of conniving and scheming to not have to face up to the dangers of returning home. But that's not what Mary chose to do. She chose to do the right thing, following God's plan for her life, even though it meant her life was in danger. And just like Mary, we need to do the right thing, no matter what the consequences. Sometimes we choose to follow God when it's convenient. It's easy to come out to a church filled with other Christians and say, oh, how I love Jesus, because everybody's going to be smiling and singing right along with us. It's a very different thing when you're at work. And everyone in the, in the factory points at you as the goody two-shoes and you're the butt of all the jokes. Everybody's putting the pranks, uh, you know, gluing your locker shut and making you look bad. Everybody is harassing you, making fun of you. Will you still be consistent in following God even when you face negative consequences? Mary did. And we learn from her example of faithfulness. That even when we face these difficult choices, we want to consistently follow God, no matter what the consequences. Third journey is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. This is the journey we typically think about, the Christmas journey. Chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Jumping down, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he, was, he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, 
and was expecting a child. Here is the third undesirable journey that Mary makes. Okay. Once a day, once again, it's a ten-day trek, uh, either uh, through Samaria or around Samaria, down through that desolate wilderness on the Bethlehem. But then, this time, Joseph comes along with Mary. This time, she's nine months pregnant. If you've ever been around a woman who is nine months pregnant, you know the last thing she wants to do is travel for ten days on a donkey. This lesson teaches us about accepting physical pain. Nine months pregnant just being still is painful. Any little disruption increases that pain. And you think about Mary traveling for ten days. Nine months pregnant. Mary was probably in pain every step of the way. If she rode the donkey, scripture doesn't tell us, but if she rode the donkey, every step the donkey took was a jar to her. Uh, I remember when Rodney was pregnant both times. You know, you get her in the car and you're driving down the road. Slow down, slow down. Make the bumps easier. Mary didn't have that option. It was a very painful journey. And it's one that she endured with faith, looking to God for His strength each day. How do we respond in life when we face painful circumstances? Some people have a lot higher tolerance to pain than others. Some people turn to med medications for pain. But even beyond physical pain, what about emotional pain? So many people, Christmas is a time of joy, but it's a time of great emotional pain. Because of broken relationships, because of tension, because of difficulty. In all of the painful situations we face in life, the key is always the same. To turn to God for his comfort and strength. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. When we read that verse, we get the idea God is a God of great comfort. He understands what we go through. He cares about us. And He gives us comfort in the painful situations we face, both in physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, and hurt. The book of Habakkuk, a very obscure Old Testament prophet, very short book, Habakkuk 3. Uh, we read of Habakkuk's response to a very trying situation. He says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Habakkuk said, even though I've got nothing, I'm still going to rejoice in God. We often stop when we read those verses there. But we continue on, and the next verse says, The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. How do you keep going when your whole world seems to be falling apart? The Sovereign Lord is my strength. Remember Isaiah 40, uh, a verse that many of us know. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. In difficult days, in times where of pain, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, we remember the key of Nehemiah 8. The joy of the Lord is your strength. How do we go on? How do we have that faith when we face painful circumstances? We turn to God. We rejoice in the Lord. And our God gives us the strength we need. Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem, and, and their whole life is forever changed. But they drew their strength from the Lord. If you look down in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, after all the angels and the shepherds and the worshiping one, we find these words. But Mary treasured up all these things, 
and pondered them in her heart. Mary took time to consider what God was doing. She took time to evaluate. She had a heart filled with the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord was her strength, even in painful times. If you are going through a difficult time in life right now, facing pain, allow God to give you strength, to give you comfort. May, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. A fourth Christmas journey is found in Matthew chapter 2. If you page back to the first gospel, the gospel of Matthew chapter 2. We find here uh, the record of the Magi, the Oriental wise men coming. Uh, I've shared this in the past. I believe that they were probably Persian Jews. Jews who were living in Persia, left over from the exile, who were looking forward to their Messiah coming. And so they traveled to see the newborn Messiah. That's not the journey I want to consider but rather the journey that takes place after they come. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by that route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. What do we see here? This fourth journey is a lesson for us about accepting warnings of danger. Joseph and Mary are miraculously warned by God that they need to flee for their lives. Because Herod is about to seek out all the newborn babies to kill them. Did he? Yes, he did. Verse 16 tells us, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. What would have happened if Mary and Joseph would have ignored God's warnings? They would have been right in the middle of all that turmoil. Could the baby Jesus have been protected? He could have been. Because God could have kept him safe. But it's so far easier to listen to God's warnings of danger and being out of the situation altogether. Mary and Joseph had the faith to believe that God knows best. And that's a lesson for us to learn as we, we think about God's warnings. God knows best. We know that in our heads to be true, but far too often, we ignore God's warnings for us. Most of us won't have an angel speak to us and warn us of danger. We won't have a vision from God. But we do have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Romans 8 tells us, So dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you keep on following it, you will perish. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you turn from it and its evil deeds, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So as Christians, we are led by the Holy Spirit who warns us of the danger, of the consequences that come from not following God. Ezekiel 36, 27 says, And I will put my Spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Galatians 5.16 5, 6, 5, says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us by God to help us to follow God faithfully. The Holy Spirit warns us of the dangers of disobeying God. When we follow the Spirit, we're kept safe. But far too often we disregard the warnings of the Holy Spirit. And we end up going down the pathway to sin and corruption and destruction. 
How does God warn us of danger today? First of all, He has given us the Holy Spirit. Secondly, through His Word. Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your Word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We may not have warnings through dreams and visions, but God warns us through His Word of the consequences of disobedience. He says, when you obey me, I will bless you. When you disobey me, there will be consequences. And just like Mary and Joseph, we want to listen very carefully to the consequences, to God's warnings of danger, and follow closely to the leading of the Holy Spirit. God warns us of consequences when we disobey Him. Many times we foolishly ignore those warnings. Instead, we want to faithfully follow the Spirit, faithfully follow the Word of God, so that God can bless our lives. The fifth unwanted journey is found in Matthew 2, verse 19. It says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Here we see Mary and Joseph's test of faith in accepting God's redirections in their life. So often we make our plans, but God redirects our plans and redirects our life. And we have to be willing to accept God's redirection. When the news comes to Mary and Joseph living in Egypt uh, with their son Jesus, <coughs> that they would come back to come back home to Israel, it appears that Joseph's plan was to go back to Bethlehem. His family had been from, from Bethlehem, even though he'd been living up north in Nazareth. He says, you know what, I'm going to come back to Bethlehem. It was pretty nice when we were there for the census when Jesus was born. Family took us in. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. But God intervened and changed that plan. That's the same type of intervention we face in our lives as well. We, we plan, we pre prepare, we chart our course, but God steps in and says, no, I'm going to shut that door because I want you to go a different way in life. So why would God do that? Why would God shut the door to Bethlehem and get them up north to Nazareth? There's several reasons for it. Number one, it allows Jesus to grow into man, but out of the public eye, where he can have a relatively normal childhood, where he can be in the northern region of Galilee, out of the sh out of out in the shadows, out of the public eye. Anymore. There's a lot less Roman activity in the north. But there's a far greater reason why God wanted his son Jesus growing up in Galilee as opposed to Judea in the south. And that is because in the north, in Galilee, they had a very detailed system of discipleship. <coughs> rabbis would take apprentice rabbis under their wing and train them in all areas of life. We've talked about this before. Every, every Jewish boy would go to the, the rabbi school and very early in life they would go and they'd learn all the basics. And then the ones who excelled would go on further in their training. The ones who, who didn't cut, who weren't that good of students, they'd go off and become fishermen or carpenters or any other line of work. But those who excelled went on and, and they had more training. And then they would pick out a rabbi. And they would come and follow that rabbi everywhere he went. And the rabbi would test him. And, and the rabbi then would choose uh, he, you would go and choose a rabbi, and if you measured up, then you could follow that rabbi and become his disciple. And then you traveled with that rabbi everywhere he went, watching everything he did, being just like him in every way. And it's in that context that Jesus grows up, where the system of discipleship is in place. Notice when Jesus starts his ministry, what he does. He goes out and he calls disciples to himself. He says, you did not choose me, I chose you. These fishermen were the ones who never cut it in rabbi school. The, the population would have said, ah, oh, you know, they're not that good, they're not that bright, they can't do that much, let them go off and catch fish for us. But Jesus said, no, I see in you 
great potential. It says in another place in the scripture, not many wise are chosen, not many mighty after the flesh. God has chosen the lowly things. Okay. You know, when we look around and you think, you know, probably nobody here is going to run for president. Nobody here is going to be governor of Michigan. Sometimes I think there's not a whole lot I can do. I don't have that many gifts. But God has something each one of us can do. When we look at the example of his picking his disciples, he didn't pick the cream of the crop. Yep, the apostle Paul, he was cream of the crop. He was top of the tops. But the disciples, they were common, everyday men like you and me. And so, it's in this context that we see why would God have Jesus raised up in the north? Why would he redirect Mary and Joseph go back north to, to Nazareth? Because they had the system of discipleship there that uniquely prepared Jesus for calling his disciples. Sometimes we question, why is it that God intervenes in my life and changes all the plans that I've already made? Because he has something far better in store for us. A couple weeks ago, I told the story of uh, our getting a new dryer down in Fort Wayne. How our dryer broke down the night before Thanksgiving. Why is that? Because on Black Friday, God had a dryer down in Fort Wayne that they didn't make for a couple of years that was uniquely prepared for us. We got for forty dollars. You know, we look at the roadblocks that come, the obstacles that God redirects us in those situations. We understand that God is not cruel or mean to redirect our courses in life. Rather, it is God's love and compassion for us that causes Him to act. And just like Mary and Joseph, when we face those situations where our life is redirected in a way we had not planned, we need to look for the hand of God at work in our lives. It is far too easy for us to turn to grumbling and complaining, all oh, that God, I had everything worked out and fell through. Instead, we want to look for what God is doing in our lives. Join God in His work. Embrace the redirection in our life as the hand of God at work. Five Christmas journeys. All us an ideal, but each one of us, each one of them teaches us something different. We need to accept the unexpected and have faith in God's will. We need to accept dangerous consequences. And consistently and faithfully obey God no matter what the cost is. We need to accept pain in our lives and allow God to comfort and strengthen us with His joy. We need to accept God's warnings and rely on His Spirit and His Word to direct our lives. And we need to accept God's redirection in our life and look for His hand at work in the details of our lives. Let's pray. God, each one of us here is going to be facing... One, of the, one or more of these five journeys coming up in the big say it. And we want to be those who respond in faith. We don't want to just be reactive. And when something happens, we react to it. Okay. We want to be those who, by faith, look for you to work. Expect you to work in our life. And that when you do work, we rejoice in what you're doing. We want to be those who respond in faith. Who follow the leading of your Holy Spirit who turn to you and allow your joy to fill our hearts. Father, help us to learn from what we've seen this morning. Help us to live a life of faith and to honor you. We pray in Jesus' name. In closing, as the praise team comes, we're going to sing the song, God will make a way that reminds us no matter what the situation we face, God can bring about great opportunities for us. And then when we're done with that, Jim Lee, I'll ask you if you come in this way.